field recording. The art of finding a grassy field and hitting plain record on your cassette recorder. Is that what it is? Recording fields? Maybe it's recording energy fields around animated entities. Hmm, maybe it's eavesdropping on ghosts. Field recording is an insanely interesting hobby, if you're me. And for some, a very lucrative career. This is the first video in my field recording series, an introduction to field recording. It's total nerdy stuff, and it's coming right up. So, good day and welcome to the Time Preservation Society. I'm Luke Skywalker. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell notification so you can be notified the minute new content drops. Cheers! In this video, I'll fully explain what field recording is, and I'll touch on the different types of gear you'd expect to find in a field recordist's kit. The very first video here, this one, is totally in studio. I didn't go out into the field for this one. It's the basics, and it's all talky-talky. Stay on the lookout for additional companion videos in this series in the very near future, where I'll actually be out in the field showing you how it's done, if you want to know. Okay, so what even is field recording? Here's what the dictionary has to say. A permanent copy of sounds or images made outside a controlled studio environment, typically with portable equipment. Here's what Wikipedia has to say. Field recording is the term used for an audio recording produced outside a recording studio, and the term applies to recordings of both natural and human-produced sounds. These recordings are very useful for sound designers and for scientists. But sound designers, hmm, that's a great career if you know what you're doing. So basically, if you are outside of a controlled environment like this one right now that I'm in, like a, like a studio, and you're recording sounds, any sounds, then you are field recording. You're recording audio in the field, the field being not the studio, not a controlled environment, out in the world. So you're not recording fields. I mean, a field reporter doesn't stand in a field all day and comment on what's going on there. Yes, the grass seems to be growing about 0 0.000007 millimeters today, as you can see. What's that? Yeah, uh, well, it's growing quite slowly. Thanks for paying me $67,000 per year to do this. Back to you, Chuck. But that reporter is actually recording audio outside of the studio, so kinda yes. He's a uh, sort of field recording. Grabbing a portable recorder and a mic or two, or a portable recorder with built-in mics, and collecting audio from anywhere outside your studio is field recording. There you go. Ta-da! But it's more than just that for me. I'm more than a super mega nerd. Uh, for me, it's, it's capturing and preserving an actual slice of time as it happened. That's what it is to me. I mean, somewhat. <laughs> During the moment while you're recording, you're experiencing the moment in real time as it's happening. But when you preserve that recording, you've now provided a window back through time. Hence the name of my little channel here, the Time Preservation Society. There you go, if you didn't know. And you can revisit that time just as it happened whenever you want, because you're the curator of moments. I like words. Especially when you record with a stereo pair of mics, or a binaural mic, or even ambisonic mics. Because when you go back and listen 35 years later to that ambisonics recording of your mother or father or grandparents talking in their old living room, you're instantly transported back in time. Because for me, I remember the acoustics of a room. 
any room, but especially old rooms from my past, like my childhood, from 3,000 years ago. The particular bounce of certain frequencies off the wall, off that unique picture frame, off the old table you ate dinner at 450 times, you know what I mean? When you're in the moment, it's just an ordinary moment. It's an ordinary, mundane day. Nothing special about it whatsoever. Until you've years ago lost those people and places and decide to go visit them again in full stereo. Binaural or even ambisonics immersion would be even better. That room reverb is 100% recognizable and does most of the heavy lifting to transport you back there, especially in stereo. Even without anyone speaking, just listening to the room, at least for me, transports you back in time. Okay, enough with the potentially sad stuff, although the principle stands. I've been field recording for a long, long time. I first started dabbling recording everything back in 1992, which was the last of the Mohicans and Army of Darkness ago. But field recording is so vast, it's capturing the sound of a particular creaking branch as it sways in the breeze, or the way the wind hits a window, or the sound of a tree falling in the forest, which is totally silent unless you were there, or the rumble of a bridge as cars pass over top, or the sound of a babbling brook as the waters wind around a bend, or the sound of crows at dusk, the roar of an ocean wave, the sound of whales singing, the sound of children playing of an old creepy jack-in-the-box, maybe a creaky rocking chair, or the hustle and bustle of a busy outdoor market. The sound of an explosive fart from a wicked fat guy. Maybe you want to collect impacts, like, uh, like an axe hitting a log, or a rock hitting an empty oil drum, or a window being broken, and then layer them all together to create like a new drum sound. That's uh, sound design for music. All of these sounds can be preserved or woven into a library of sound effects to be used in movies or dramatic podcasts or video games or more. Whether you're recording a university lecture or the sound of a toilet flushing, you're field recording and you're preserving time. That's what you're doing. So how does one go about getting into field recording? Well, money. It's money. It's so much money. It's why do my interests always cost so much money, money. I need more money. Luckily, I uh, went back in time and stole this sports almanac from an unsuspecting teenager in funny clothes. A weird old man was also trying to get this, but I easily thwarted him. And now to go way back in time and give this to my younger self. This is a perfect plan and will in no way backfire. Anyway, field recording costs money, but you can start relatively cheaply. I'm going to put away some of my jokes and gags and stuff for now so I can really get to work explaining the following section of this video without distractions. So here are the droids you're looking for. Gear. All-in-one recorders. A very quick and cheap way to get into this field recording thing and how I got into it was by purchasing a small stereo battery-powered digital recorder. This guy right here. These can vary in price from $100 to $1,500. I started years ago with this Zoom H1. I still have it, obviously. It's a good little recorder, light and small, and records in stereo, and uh, it's about $100. Um, there's actually a Zoom H1N, which is a newer version of this guy, uh, which I have as well. Uh, it features uh, you know, a stereo cardioid electric condenser XY capsule, like two mics here that allows you to record for hours uh, of field recording in stereo and fits right in your pocket. We will cover what X, Y, and other configurations mean in the next video in the series, so stay tuned for that one. But it's a, a very small recorder. It measures, oh, hold on a second, let me just find my trusty old measuring tape here. <laughs> you know, this measuring tape was manufactured by a smart man named Lucius Fox. I. Picked it up in Gotham in 2008. 
Anyway. It measures about 5.5 inches long, 2 inches wide at the top, and a half inch thick. You can also upgrade with the same Zoom brand by getting something like the Zoom H5 or the H6, which is, is what I did. This is a larger stereo field recorder, but adds some additional functionality by giving you XLR inputs. I don't know if you can see them here. There's two right there. Uh, and these XLR inputs uh, accompany that XY capsule. You can run them all together for four mics all together. Uh, you can get one for around uh, $300. Just about the highest end all-in-one pocket stereo digital field recorder would be the Sony D100. This recorder is no longer in production, but you can still find them used in some new old stock, I guess it would be called. The built-in mics and the preamps on the D100 are amazing. Very quiet. But now you're talking about, I don't know, over a thousand used if you can find one. But it has no XLR ins, and while it's a fantastic pocket stereo recorder, it's very limited to just being a pocket stereo recorder. But it's the best one ever made for that type of functionality. That's not hyperbole. That is really, I mean, any field recorder that's played with one knows that it's the best of an all-in-one, right? Like this, where you can just pull it out and hit record and go. It's the best. So far, I'd like to see some... Um, companies, you know, beat that because, you know, 32-bit recording, all kinds of new future uh, improvements could be added and it could be amazing. But anyway, I digress. From there, you can start getting into much higher end recorders, recorders that don't come with microphones built in. Sound devices mix pre-recorders are about as high end as you can get for field recording purposes. Uh, there is, of course, even fancier and better recorders than the Mixed Pre series, but they're more designed for location sound, for film sets, and the like. But for field recording purposes, you can't get better, in my opinion, than the Mixed Pre series, which starts at around $900 for the Mixed Pre 3, which is this one right here. Um, in the higher end Zoom field recorder line, the Zoom ones like this guy, right? You could go with any F series recorder. Uh, except for the F1 and the F2, which are pieces of shit. The Zoom F3 is relatively featureless, but it will record in 32-bit float with two XLR ins and is around 300 bucks. It's a nice compact micless, but potentially mic full recorder. The F6 has all kinds of great features and six simultaneous ins for around $800. There's all kinds of settings and bells and whistles and you can decide on when choosing a field recorder. So it's a good idea to not only figure out what you'll need to begin, but also think it through and figure out what you will need in the future. Try to future-proof your gear purchases if you can. We will do a video in this series that'll touch on recorder selection and budget in the future. As for me, I currently own the Zoom H1, the, Zoom, the newer Zoom H1n, um, the Zoom H5, the Sound Devices Mix Pre 3, and the Mix Pre 6 too, which is currently what I'm recording this video on right now. That's why I'm not showing you. It's over there. You can't see it. Now on to microphones. There are many types of microphones that belong in a field recording kit. We'll start with Omnis. Omni-electric condenser microphones are very popular for stereo ambience recording. They have an omnidirectional polar pattern, which means they pick up equally from all around it. Omnis are best used spaced out in an A-B configuration when stereo field recording. Once again, we'll get into mic configurations in the next video. Popular field recording Omni mics are the Loam Basic Ucos, or Usi Pros, or Clip EEM 272s, or even the DPA 4060s. And they range in price from 100 bucks to thousands. I have pairs of Clippies and Lom Bass Gucos. That's what I've got. They're great. Small diaphragm cardioid condenser mics have a specific heart-shaped polar pattern that project outwards like a flashlight beam. It's a little more complex than that, but I'm keeping it simple for this introduction video. A pair of them oriented in XY configuration is best or the, uh, you know, ORTF, uh, which again, we'll get into it in the future, uh, is the best configuration for these types of mics. While the small diaphragm versions are usually a first choice due to easy portability, uh, large diaphragm versions have also been used with great success. Many field recordists have used them. Popular field recording small diaphragm cardioid condenser microphones are Line Audio CM4s or the CM3s, 
Sennheiser 8040s or the Shop's uh, CMC 6U system. The prices range from 100 bucks to thousands. So you could you can go really high with that. I personally have some pairs of Lion Audio Sam 4s, uh, some Slate ML2s for you know easy to destroy. Uh, some deity mics, um, probably some other ones kicking around here somewhere. I just can't remember them. Wow. Uh, shotgun mics. Shotgun mics are usually super or hyper cardioid mics with a tighter pickup beam that kind of cancels out sounds that come from the sides thanks to its interference tube. These mics are not normally used in stereo pairs, but are instead used to capture mono sounds for better isolation in an outdoor environment. They can also be used indoors, but care must be taken to prevent phase issues due to acoustic bounce in smaller spaces getting cancelled out by the interference tube. Shotgun microphones are particularly good at picking up, you know, human voices, which is why they're used heavily on film sets. Popular shotgun mics are the Sennheiser MKH416, the Shops uh, CMIT 5U, or the Rode NTG3. Prices for popular shotgun mics range from $300 to thousands. I have a Sennheiser MKH416 and a DD S Mic 2. Those are the ones that I own personally. Dynamic mics are usually cardioid or hypercardioid polar patterns. They're directional and they're low powered but can handle loud sounds. Dynamic mics can usually handle an insane amount of sound pressure. They would not be optimal for stereo ambience recording in, say, a forest, but would be excellent for stereo ambience recording in, say, a noisy factory. They can be used in stereo pairs in an XY or RTF configuration for noisy stereo applications or used as a single mono mic to capture gunshots or building demolitions or anything that's going to be really loud. Popular dynamic field recording mics are the Shure SM57s or the SM58s. Dynamics can range from $100 to more than 1000 but really... SM57s are all you're really going to need, and they're 100 bucks each. I have, personally, SM57s, SM58s, and SM7B, Electrovoice RE320, and probably other dynamic mics. I collect mics. It's a problem. But I'll only ever use the 57s in the field, really. There are figure eight microphones, of course, that can be used in a, a mid-side recording configuration, which we will touch on in another video, and microphones that use several of the previously mentioned microphones together as combo mics. Um, there's combo mics that offer several mics in one, like XY mics that are with one shaft, right? Two cardioid small diaphragm condenser microphones in one. Uh, binaural mics, which are two omni mics inside a dummy head, uh, with dummy ears, uh, ambisonic mics, which are four subcardioid microphones arranged in a tetrahedral array. Uh, subcardioid means super wide beam, you know, halfway between cardioid and omni. A popular XY microphone is the Audio Technica BP4025 for about $700. Uh, a popular binaural mic is the AWI SR3D for about 300 USD. A popular ambisonic mic is a Sennheiser Ambio VR uh, for about $1,400. I have a couple of AWI SR3D binaural mics, and they're fabulous, but I don't have the other ones. But there are other types of mics as well. Weird and interesting mics. Contact mics are an excellent way of detecting sound vibrations through objects or hard surfaces. You can stick a contact mic onto, say, a pocket watch and listen to the ticks as translated from vibrations to sound. They will not pick up vibrations through the air, as regular mics do, so this makes isolating a precise sound much easier when recording. Popular contact mics are the JRF C-Series Pro or the AKG C411s. These are best used in stereo pairs for a really fantastic stereo effect, if you can. I have a pair of handmade JRF C-Series Pro contact mics that I use regularly, and I love them. Hydrophones are contact mics for underwater. They're waterproof mics that listen for vibrations traveling through the water. These are the mics that scientists use to listen to whales or hear other underwater events. 
Popular hydrophones are the Aquarian Audio H2D or the JRF D-Series hydrophones. And the prices range from $100 to $500 or more. Surprisingly, I don't own any hydrophones. But I'd like to in the future. And after I give this almanac to my younger self, I can buy all the hydrophones. There are electromagnetic sensors that detect electromagnetic energy fields and convert them to audio. Um, a popular electromagnetic mic is the Lohm Electro Uzi, which, if you can secure a set, would run you about $30, but other brands can cost much more. I own a pair of Electro Uzis, and they are great. You can watch it right here if you want. Geophones are seismic event detectors that measure seismic activity. It can record even the faintest vibrations in all kinds of mediums, including soil. They tend to accentuate the extreme low end of the frequency spectrum. A popular geophone is the Loam Geophon, which, if you can secure one, would run $175 each. I'll be doing a review on the Loam Geophon in the coming weeks because I do have one here ready to review. <laughs> Finally, parabolic dish microphones. These are the spy microphones that can listen in to, you know, pinpoint sounds from much further away. They actually do what many people think shotgun mics do, but don't actually do. However, since the wavelengths of low frequencies are massive, you'd need a dish larger than 60 feet in diameter to hear 20 hertz. A parabolic mic only picks up the mids and highs, really, so the quality of the audio from a parabolic dish mic is lessened since the lows aren't captured. You can find decent parabolic dish mics for as little as $200 or as much as $2,000 or more, really. I don't own a parabolic dish microphone. Again, the Almanac. So there's that. So those are the mics. There are other more obscure mics out there, but uh, I'm just sticking with the popular types for this video. And uh, the video is getting quite long anyway. And those are your main gear options. But there are other things, little things that you might need. A lot of little things. Cables and clips and shock mounts and wind protection like blimps or baby ball gags or furries. Batteries and power packs and sticky tack and tape and tripods and dry bags and headphones and a good quality audio bag to put it all in. All of these little things might be needed in your kit, depending on where you go and what you're doing. But the worst thing to have happen, other than losing all of your gear down a sinkhole or glacier chasm, is forgetting to pack something that you'll need. So that's some of your basic field recording gear options. How to use all this stuff and why is for another video in this series. Some people like collecting sounds as a hobby. Some do it professionally. If you get very good at field recording, you could capture sounds that many would and do pay for. A clean multi-microphone recording of a building being demolished is worth money. A clean and isolated recording of a loon on a still lake on a windless morning is worth money. A rainless thunder without human sound pollution is worth money. There's all kinds of options for making money collecting sounds, and working on a high-quality niche sound library is a worthwhile effort. I'm uh, doing that currently, and will release it as soon as I think it's ready, when it's done, when I think it's done. TV shows, movies, video games, commercials, YouTube channels, all of these endeavors need high-quality sound effects all the time. Why not provide them? I love field recording. I love the concept, the creativity, the time preservation, the sounds, the process, the editing, the camaraderie among other field recorders. It's a really awesome thing to be into if you're anything like me, and you are, or else you wouldn't be watching this this far into this video. In the coming months, I'm going to be going pretty deep into field recording in this series. Uh, from mic configurations to when to use, which mic where, to packing your sound bag, to editing your sounds, to using the UCS, Universal Category System, to categorize your sounds, and all kinds of other super nerdy neat stuff. So be on the lookout for more videos in this series. And may the force be with you. Bye now. End transmission. Okay, so if you're in the past with me, 
this video right here is a randomly chosen video that I think you should watch, right? But if you're in the future, it'll be the next video in this series. Uh, in either, either way, just click on it, whatever. This is, this, these are the ones to watch. Bye.